So the fry deck is related to the Amazonica poly, which is related to the pink dragon all through the Alocasia lawii. It is no secret that I love Alocasia. It is definitely my favourite genus and um, I'm having a lot of fun collecting it. I seem to have quite a lot of luck growing Alocasia. So yeah, I want to take you through my Alocasia and basically convince you that this is the best genus of all time ever. For instance, did you know that the original Eastern tellings of Jack and the Beanstalk were actually about the Alocasia rather than a beanstalk. The Alocasia is known as the tree that grows to the heavens because it's so massive. And as you can see, some of them here are absolutely like they're massive already and they're in my home and they're not gonna reach their full potential. And that story is over 5,000 years old. So this has been like knocking about in folklore and myths and legends for 5,000 years, which is pretty awesome. They are hella toxic. They are so, so, so toxic. However, their tuba has been used as a food source like the potato for I think 28,000 years or something. And that's because if you boil it to a certain degree or ferment it, then the oxalates in it are neutralized and it becomes a really nice potato-like substance or food. Delicious and nutritious. However, I really wouldn't recommend eating any of your house plants because most of them have been hybridized to the point of I, I just wouldn't trust it. Plus it seems like quite an expensive potato, you know what I mean? But enough about potatoes. This is my first alocasia and it is an alocasia pink dragon. It is a cultivar of the alocasia longoloba, which I think is a new name for the lawii, so called because of these long lobes here. It has these wonderful pink stems as well, and I'm not entirely sure how this happened, whether it was crossed, what the deal is, how it got these kind of awesome pink stems, but yes, it's the alocasia pink dragon. Now, my personal experience of this is that it's very, very easy. If you are, sorry, just, that is just a um, biological pest control there. So let's just ignore that there. It's pretty cool. It's very striking. The party is in the petioles. These actually, by the way, are not stems. We call them stems, but the stem is kind of like the trunky bit at the bottom, which you can't really see. Let me just, that is the stem and these are the petioles. So it's got a very short sort of stem. It's much more like a trunk as it grows up. If you want a beginner alocasia, try this. It is not finicky at all. I haven't had any problems. It's quite forgiving of bad watering to a degree, um, but it's not gonna like flop over like this one here. It's, it's, it's a very, very chill plant. It was actually one of my first ones and I would say that this is definitely a beginner friendly alocasia and I found it very hard to like make unhappy to be fair and it's giving me nothing but growth. It just pops these corms out onto the surface so it's just been popping these up. I did propagate one of the corms and turn it into a little one so I've got a little pink dragon which is just pushing a new leaf there. That's pretty cool and you might be able to see it's got these flowers which are kind of spent now so that one spent completely and that one came out a bit afterwards and I mean it's not looking its, its best but this is a sterile plant essentially because it's been hybridized so many times it won't go to seed so that's a bit of a shame because that would have been super cool. However it has also given me a little pup there, I don't know, can you see that? Yeah, there. So that's coming out of the side too. And this is basically what alocasias do. So what will happen is they will push like lots of little corms up onto the top of the surface of the soil. And there'll be some in there when you repot an alocasia, you come across all these little baby corm things and then you can either leave them in the soil and then they'll eventually sprout out like that one that popped there. Or you can actually take them off and propagate them like I did here. And this is kind of cool because then you can, you know, give them to friends or plant swap or, you know, swap for cuttings. It's a very cool thing to do. But, you know, it's a pretty minimalist plant. So if you want to have more going on, if you then, 
yeah, leave it in so that it starts to bush out and you get more plant because these never have too many leaves at, on, on each plant. There's like usually about five, six maximum. So you want to have a couple of plants in a pot if you can in order to make it nice and bushy. Next up is my Alocasia lautabachiana or purple sword Alocasia. And this is so cool. I call it Jagger due to these kind of serrated scalloped edges and the fact that they've got these lance shaped things. I kind of think it looks a bit like the Iron Throne if you see what I mean there. So yeah, it feels quite badass. It is another one that has given me loads of pups. If you see these little ones at the bottom, this has given me pups for days basically. Now I believe that I, if this one flowered, I would be able to propagate it. It is named after Karl Lauterbach, who discovered the yellow-breasted boa bird, apparently, which is nice and sweet. These stems are quite sort of stripy and you, I don't think you can tell on camera. It's very hard. I've tried to actually take pictures of it, but they're kind of almost like a muted um, Zabrina pattern but like much much darker so you can't really sort of see it that well but it's very cool and this one just grows all the time again I would say very 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 beginner friendly the only thing with it is that it does like a drink and essentially when it wants a drink uh, you you know you'll think you're sort of like oh I watered it a few days ago um, it, it's probably fine and then you'll go back in the evening and it kind of basically just completely and utterly flops down and all of these just flop onto, flop onto the floor and it basically looks like it's melted. It looks kind of cool to be honest when it does that I've got to say but also quite scary because you're like oh my god is my plant gonna die. I would suggest if you want like a show-stopping striking one the Lauterbachiana is, is very easy going and chill. Definitely give it a go. Next up is my Alocasia Zabrina. By the way, all of these um, sachets are actually biological pest control because I just got sick of like cleaning my plants with neem oil. Anyway, that's by the by. The stems on this are what gives this plant the name. So the Alocasia Zabrina, so called because of these zebra-like stems. Now this is so cool, you would kind of think it was a cultivar or a man-made something or other, but it's not. It's actually naturally occurring and it's actually listed as an endangered species in the Philippines because it has been so poached, you know, and we talk about plant poaching all the time. But luckily in Europe, and I'm assuming, I don't know actually how available this is in America, but in Europe, this is so easy to get. It's in almost every garden center. Now, my experience again with growing this, and I know I keep on saying this, but this is like another one that's not really been very hard. And it gave me loads and loads and loads of growth through the winter as well. But I'm particularly excited. And let's see if I can get this in shot. The size of this leaf here is phenomenal. It's so good. It's just like every leaf is just coming out bigger and bigger and bigger. It's a very happy plant, but it's also quite robust as well. I have to say this is another one when it's sort of very, very thirsty, it'll totally flop, but actually it just doesn't do that as quickly as for instance, the Lauterbachiana. It's got these cool kind of tribal markings there, if you can see, which I really like. You can get variegated versions of this, or even like um, you get the Zabrina reticulata, which has like patterns on it. But I really like the fact that the, the leaves are quite simple. They've just got this tribal marks there and that the stems are actually the the main attraction. I kind of wouldn't want to detract away from that. I have seen that people have made the sort of black stem Sabrina and I'm like, well, why, why on earth would you want to do that? What a nutty thing to do. This is so cool as it is. I would say of all of the allocations, this is a pretty hardy one. It, it tolerates a lot of cold as well. Like if you, if you're not in the warmest place, consider this alocasia. This one's much, much more tolerant. I think it's the thick leaves. It doesn't have like massive opinions about, you know, temperature changes. My next one is this alocasia regal shield. Now, this is very cool. It's an upright elephant ear, so it basically has these upright ones. It doesn't go down like this. The leaf will always 
remain up and this patterning on the back you can see it's got purple leaves and green stems and veining which is very very cool it almost looks like there's like a silvery sheen on the purple as well underneath this doesn't really play very well on camera but i am going to put in a picture that i took the other day because it's just like silk it's like dark black silk it's amazing it is the most beautiful beautiful leaf I have ever 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 known it's like somebody designed it and hand made it with every intention of this being the most expensive wonderful leaf in the world ever I'm totally off track this is the regal shield alocasia I'm so sorry it is a hybrid of the alocasia odora which is one of the really large upright elephant ears and the alocasia regine Reginula, Reginula, which is also known as the Alocasia Black Velvet. Reginula translates to Little Queen and it's that part of the name that gives it like the regal part, the regal and the shield is the Odora. Now this one is probably my thirstiest of the Alocasias and I mean bear in mind that it's got like the fattest stems and so it's kind of holding the most water. You can't miss a watering with this one, you really can't. It's given me a little bit of a headache in that sense I must say and it's another one that kind of melts but when this one melts it like goes straight forward and knocks down everything in its path so you need to give this some space um I am definitely going to be putting it in a passive hydro uh self-watering system because I will not be held hostage to these demanding water requirements <laughs> oh I do like it. It's got a new leaf in this stem as well, which is, you know, obviously going to be even bigger than this because they size up. So I'm really excited to see that. Next up, I am so happy to be dealing with the smaller ones now. This is the Alocasia Amazonica Poly. And this is the one that basically most people can find in pretty much any old garden centre, big box store. They are very readily available. Now, I've heard a lot of people have trouble looking after these um, and I don't know if that's just because they're not like great with allocations on the whole or whether they are not great with this. I can already see because of like the curls and the curls of the leaves and like the, you know, sharp lobe there that I can see why this one in particular would be quite attractive to spider mites. So yeah, I need to be really like cautious of that. I have all of these biological controls on my alocasias predominantly because spider mites are such a prevalent pest for them. And funnily enough, I've had spider mites like a lot in my collection, but I've never had them on my alocasias. And I just know that it would just decimate them and I just don't really want to have to deal with that. So. I got some predatory mites instead to put on and so if any spider mite dares to go near my collection they will suffer essentially. But back to this one, this is kind of cool. Basically it is a cultivar of the Amazonica which is a cultivar of the Longolobia. There are no alocasias native to the Amazon. They are specifically native to Southeast Asia. You will not find them naturally occurring anywhere else in the world. They were named after the Amazonica nursery, which was a nursery in Florida, which is now closed. And the guy that hybridized the Amazonica was, um, well, he was like part-time nursery owner, crossbreeder of plants and then part-time postman basically because it wasn't like paying too well. I think it was hybridized in the 70s when there was obviously a boom in the house plant collecting market but like nothing like now. Anyway it's sort of sad to think that he's like not getting the just desserts basically of the wonder that is his houseplant now because it's probably the most available one. There are like two cultivars of the Amazonica. That's this one, the poly, and then you get the bambino which has much smaller leaves. But this has kind of thinner leaves and shorter petioles and it will grow to roughly the size that my Zabrina is now. That's going to be the maximum height of it. The Zabrina is like going to grow much bigger. The leaves are pretty robust. It holds water pretty well. I don't think it's as sensitive as some of them with relation to the kind of watering needs, although, I mean, it is an alocasia. 
so you know it does like a little bit of a drink but yeah i mean it just seems pretty easy to grow it hasn't kind of caused me any dramas i'm getting a lot of value out of it the backs of this are purple like the pink dragon as well which is kind of cool and the stems are sort of pink but they're not quite as pink as the pink dragon but they are related. Next up we have this one. This is the Michalitziana Maxkovsky eye, more commonly known as the Frydeck, although the Frydeck is the variegated version. It's very cool. It's got these velvet leaves with this striking veining of like almost luminous white. I have learned a lot about this uh, plant since I've had it. It's kind of a cheap one. It's not really mine. I bought it for somebody as a gift and basically as it arrived and was delivered to me, it was in this pot that was like twice the size and anybody who knows anything about alocasias knows that alocasias do not like big pots, okay? They like to have a snug home, a cosy home. And another thing was it was pure peat. So it was basically like this soggy, pure peat, large pot, twice this size, and it just looked pretty miserable. So as like leaf after leaf died off within the first kind of few days of me having it, I then took it out of its pot and investigated and found that not only did it have a really small root system as I suspected, but in fact it was also in one of those horrible constricting nylon nets and all of the roots were getting crushed in it. And that like properly winds me up. It's so, so annoying. Like I know why growers do it because they obviously want the plants to have a shelf life so that people buy more plants essentially. However, it does like just really, really piss me off because if I'd have handed that over like the day that I got it, that would have died for somebody. Anyway, nonetheless, I repotted it. I put it into a smaller pot with some really nice soil, which is cocoa coir, um, perlite and lots of little bark chunks as well and it's doing really well. That was kind of, I don't know, nearly three months ago and it was only left with this leaf and then it put out this leaf and now this leaf and they're kind of progressively getting bigger and as you can see it's also got this leaf that's just about to unfurl that's coming out. So that's pretty exciting. It's doing really well and I've, I've got to say I absolutely love it. When this goes and I hand it over I'm probably gonna like see if I can get my hands on one. Um, I'm getting quite a large collection but I, you know it's made a pocket in my heart of love and um, once it goes, that will be empty and I'll, you know, I have to fill it, obviously. Now this is a cultivar of the poly, which also is related to the pink dragon. And you can absolutely just see this, can't you? Now we're cooking. This is the Alocasia macroriza variegata. This came with another leaf, which of course it lost because uh, I got it quite recently and it came in the post and it just didn't like that basically. But as you can see, it's variegated. It had this half moon one and out of that came this. So I was like, well, that's promising because you know, it's like slightly less variegation and I thought the next one would be fine. However, look at what we've got there. Yeah. An entirely white leaf of doom. So yeah, um, sadly, I mean, that's like just a goner basically. I'm gonna obviously allow it to grow out and the petiole here will hopefully produce another leaf. I mean, it's not looking promising, is it? unless it sort of produces something with like a little bit of green, this is this plant's kind of basically kaput, essentially. <laughs> but I have had it where I've had other plants which just basically put out white leaf after white leaf after white leaf and then suddenly give me like a really nice, you know, variegated leaf. And that that's the continuation. So I'm hoping it's like that. However, alocasias, they they don't sort of produce multiples per like node. You can't get like multiple possible growth points. It's all just like a lot more challenging with an alocasia. So the fact that this has happened this early is slightly concerning. We'll see what happens. Uh, wish me luck on that. Put a fingers crossed in the comments if, for this, please. Because it is beautiful and I really, really would like to have a big ass variegated Alocasia macroriza. Next up is the Alocasia portadora. 
So this is a baby. I am absolutely in love with the larger one, but I thought I would see if I could grow it from a bubba. We've got a new leaf in that petiole there so that's about to come out, which is really cool. So this is a hybrid of the Alocasia Adora, of which this is a hybrid from, and the Alocasia Portia or Portii or Portii, which is kind of like a zigzaggy kind of one which is very cool and that's where you get these kind of frilly edges when it grows big it has this like upright elephant ear growth pattern but it's got very frilly edges and it just looks so cool man it's basically elegant and ruffled so it kind of gives off these victorian conservatory vibes when it's massive this is the golden lutea it is a hybrid of the alocasia macroriza which was the variegated one it is a hybrid of that when this grows large it gets very bright yellow petioles and veining basically and so it looks like this kind of neon acid trip of an alocasia which is pretty cool i love that yeah i'm i'm enjoying it basically it, it's gonna it's gonna grow big it seems to be growing well it seems happy it seems to have taken root oh i've got all of the baby ones in pond by the way oh and i forgot to say so this the alocasia macroriza variegata Basically, the macroriza is a naturally occurring species. I think it's the biggest of the alocasias. And the variegation doesn't happen naturally. That happens when it's gone into like tissue culture and mass production. You get mutations when you are cloning things to that degree and sort of mucking around with genetics you get this variegation and you know genetic mutations that just happens and so this isn't something you would ever find in the world anyway but it's like a kind of deformed mutation of the naturally occurring species. But yes, onto the other Macrorhizos one. This, I, I don't know what it's crossed with or how the kind of like yellow stem thing happened. You can't really see it at this point, but eventually it will show. It seems to have taken very well in the pond, which I'm very happy about. So that's going to be good. This one can grow up to 10 feet with leaves of the span four foot so yeah that would be good i don't know this will be fun to grow but i think really by the time it starts getting big it's going to be one i'm gonna be passing on to somebody who's got more space but yeah excellent next up is the alocasia stingray this is another hybrid cultivar not a lot is known about the alocasia stingray some botanists think that this is a cultivar that was cooked up in the lab with other botanists who believe that this is a naturally occurring hybrid. But nobody seems to be able to answer the question. All I know is it is related to the Alocasia macrorhizos. It's got these very cool stingray type leaves. They get very big. It grows from eight to 10 feet. So again, another massive one. And it's got these kind of cool stems, which again are a little bit like the Alocasia zebrina. So you're starting to see like a lot of recurring traits throughout the whole genus. It's very cool to see the specific traits that they share in their evolution. Now moving on to the dual Alocasia. This is the Alocasia cupria red secret. It is native to the island of Borneo. It is also called the mirror alocasia. You can see why. It actually gets more kind of mirrory as it gets older. But when the leaves are more mature, all of this veining sort of becomes much deeper and it looks like a set of abs, basically. It looks like a shiny set of abs, which is pretty cool. I like it a lot. Oh, it's got a new leaf coming out. Oh, I love seeing that. It's very happy. This is not one that I was like super into before I got it and I know I've not got a mature sort of specimen that looks amazing but I'm really enjoying watching it grow I think it surprised me a lot actually it's given me this new leaf since I've had it and I, I just really enjoy it basically apparently there is a green version of this in but I have not seen it ever come up I don't know if anybody else has but I know that the leaves get more sort of muted as they get older and they get this sort of like less purpley or less ready 
So I don't know if actually people are talking about like a more mature specimen or if there just is a green version. So I'd be really interested to find that out. If anybody knows, drop it in the comments below. That'd be fab. And if you're not mad like me, this is a perfect alocasia to keep because it grows two feet tall or something and these leaves get bigger and sort of take up most of the space of the petiole. The thing with these is they're actually supposed to be quite short and closely compact. Um, so if they start getting a bit leggy, it means that they're not really getting the light that they require. They're reaching for the light. This is not like a leggy long stemmed alocasia. That's just not, it's, that's not what it does. So yeah, good size for a house plant. Well, not this, this is obviously far too small. We need to get this bigger, but when it gets big, Good size for a house plant if you're not mental like me. Next up is another jewel alocasia. It's also native to the island of Borneo. It is a small one. It stays kind of like one to two feet. It's got these very dramatic leaves that obviously get a lot bigger. Um, and the cool thing is you can see at the back, I don't know if that shows, the veining at the back is also kind of like etched in, which is pretty cool. I like it a lot. I like it more than I thought I would like it. I kind of like resisted getting one of these for ages because I thought the pink dragon's so much better. It's pink for Christ's sake. But um, no, I, I love this. I, I do. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing it grow. In fact, I saw one recently that was sort of full size and I really, really wanted it after having this. But then I thought, no, this this will grow. This will grow. And then finally, the Alocasia Silver Dragon, which um, again is an Alocasia Beginder, but it's the Silver Va Dragon variety. It's looking more pronounced on the camera than it does in person, I've got to say. So this is very similar to the Dragon Scale. There is no Green Dragon. There's just like the Dragon Scale and the Silver Dragon. Now I've got this in pond, as I've said with all my little ones. I've actually seen people keep this happy in cactus soil, which I wouldn't have said would have been a thing, but apparently you can do that. And they're kind of like an underwaterer. And I think that's because these ones specifically actually can live as lithophytes, which is basically when they live on the side of rocks in like little pockets of moss or something. So as long as they're kind of getting a lot of water. But personally, I'm just keeping it in pond because that's uh, easier for me at the moment. So I have now the three main dragons. I've got the pink dragon, the dragon scale, and the silver dragon. And I believe that makes me the mother of dragons. I mean, I've even got an iron throne for Christ's sake. And that is my collection at the moment. I am going to make a care video on alocasia. It's a bit complicated for me because I actually think that they are quite different. There are sort of some fairly similar things that they share. And so I'll make that about that. But then I think every alocasia almost needs a separate video because there are some significant differences for them that I have found. And I kind of feel like I'm a little bit of an aficionado of alocasias. So yeah, that that is coming. I will do a care video on that because I've got a lot to say on the matter. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to subscribe to this channel for more plant joy, please remember to hit the notification bell so you don't miss a video. Leave a comment. It'd be great to hear from you about any of the plants that I've got in my collection or any queries that you've got or your alocasia experience would be fantastic fantastic as well. Um, until next time, peace, love and plants. Cheerio.